Being alone is not an option for Christians. Our text this morning is going to be drawn from 1 Kings chapter 19. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon us this morning. May we learn from your word. May we be encouraged by your word. And may we do your word. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When I used to swim laps at the YMCA, I hoped I'd be alone and swim undisturbed in my lane. But at the Y, you're never alone. People want to swim across your path or walk across the width of the pool. Who walks across the width of the pool when people are swimming laps? But that happens there because you're never alone. In our text this morning, the great prophet Elijah goes through unimaginable challenges that push him to the edge of his faith. But the lesson that he learns is that you're never alone. You're never alone. Go ahead and open up your Bibles. Old Testament, 1 Kings chapter 19. We're going to begin in verse 1. 1 Kings chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. Now, you're probably all familiar with the story that happened right before this. It's one of the major stories of the Old Testament. We see that the northern kingdom of Israel has apostatized, and that the king and queen over the northern kingdom of Israel have gone off and worshiped false gods, and they've got as their court advisors the priests of Baal. And in the midst of this, the prophet Elijah arises. God causes him to go forth and cause trouble amongst these pagan worshiping Israelites, and a challenge is arranged on Mount Carmel. The priests of Baal come, and Elijah comes. They sacrifice an ox. They put it onto this altar. They put wood under it. They pour water all over it. The priests of Baal cut themselves and scream out to their gods all day long, and nothing happens. At the end of the day, Elijah gets on his knees and prays, and God brings fire down from heaven and completely consumes the sacrifice and the altar and the water, and then the priests of Baal are killed. And this happens, verse 1, chapter 19. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. The challenge at Mount Carmel has ended in complete victory for the prophet Elijah. But Elijah now leaves the company of Israel He's completely cleansed her, but trouble brews. Going on to verse 3. Then he was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. And he left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. After all the great things that God has done through the prophet Elijah, he's exhausted. Friends, if God does great things through you, and maybe you've had great things happen in your business, and you've stayed up late preparing for initial public offering or some such, or maybe you're waiting for the birth of a child and you're not getting any sleep for days and the event happens and it's such a high point, but then you feel as though you've been brought so low and you're exhausted and you're depressed. And this is happening here to Elijah. After all of this, Israel is still unrepentant and is seeking the prophet's death. Elijah tells his servant to go away, and now you see Elijah alone in the desert. He's all alone. He's depressed. He's exhausted. He's fearful. Don't ever assume this wouldn't happen to you, friends. And so you need to be especially watchful at the moment when God does something powerful in your lives. He sits down under the broom tree, and if you look in the Old Testament, you oftentimes see the trees are places where you bury people under. The broom tree for Elijah is death. He sits under the broom tree, and I believe he seriously and honestly asks God to take him away now. Take my life. I'm done. After all of this, after seeing all of your great power, and yet Israel and her king and queen will not repent. In fact, more than that, they want me dead. Verse 5, and he lay down and slept under the broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was 
at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water, and he ate and drank and lay down again. What a strange story. Can you imagine that? You're, you're laying down sleeping under a tree. An angel touches you, and you wake up. The angel's cooked a meal for you. There's bread, and there's drink there, and he just eats it and drinks and goes back to sleep, and you're thinking, what? Well, if you know anything about people under exhaustion and extreme circumstances, people can go through a lot of extremes, but when they're done, they're done. I've read stories about men who had been in World War II who had been in combat, and suddenly the war comes to an end, and they lay down in a ditch, and they sleep for two days straight. I believe Elijah's going through something like this. He's exhausted. He's fearful. He eats. He drinks. He falls back asleep underneath the broom tree. And under the broom tree where he eats and he drinks and he arises and goes back to sleep again, rather than being a sign of death, it is resurrection. Going on to verse 7. And the angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went into the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. Fully revived. Elijah goes 40 days and 40 nights in the strength of that food to Mount Horeb. Does anybody know what Mount Horeb is? Kids, do you know what Mount Horeb is? It's Mount Sinai. It's the other name for Mount Sinai. And you're right to assume that there are overtones here of the Exodus. We've got 40. Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And we see that here Elijah goes in 40 days and 40 nights. He comes to Mount Sinai. He comes to Mount Sinai after he's confronted the new Pharaoh and his magicians. But it's ironic, isn't it? King Ahab is wicked. His Sidonian queen Jezebel is known from her name even to this day as being a wicked name And these had led Israel astray, and they brought their priests forward. They brought their own magicians forward. And we see that Elijah has overcome them as though he were the new Moses. He's prevailed over Pharaoh and his magicians. And now in 40 days, he's come to Mount Sinai. Representing Israel, Elijah goes to meet Yahweh at the mountain. Going on to verse 9. There he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I, only I, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Now notice that Elijah here lives on or in the holy mountain. It says he came and lodged in it. He lives in the holy mountain. He lives in the holy mountain in a cave. He lives in the holy mountain in a tomb. Caves are tombs in the Old Testament. Elijah's at the end of himself, and what he says here is technically correct. As far as he knows, what he's saying is right. God comes to him and says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah says, I've been jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. The people of Israel forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. Going on to verse 11, and he said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. This is one of the most amazing stories in the scripture. In all this power and fearfulness at the end, there's this tenderness that God comes to his people with. He wants to remind Elijah of who he is and who he is to him. We see that He has him stand before Yahweh. Come to the mouth of the cave and stand before Yahweh. He comes out and he stands all alone. And Elijah, yeah, he is acting like a baby at this point. It's me and only me, and they're seeking to kill me. And after all of this, after they torn down all the altars and killed all the prophets, I'm left alone, and Yahweh God says, come to the mouth of the cave. And a tornado comes by. It's so powerful, it's tearing up the rocks on the mountain. 
And then an earthquake shakes the mountain of God. And then a firestorm passes by. And after all these frightening manifestations of the power of God comes the sound of a low whisper. Verse 13, And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Now remember, Elijah was told to come to the mouth of the cave, but he must have retreated back in. God, of course, would have protected him, but seeing these powerful manifestations of God working through nature caused him to go back into the cave and shelter himself, but now he comes back out to the mouth of the cave, and the conversation that he had with God in verses 9 and 10 is repeated. What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the people of Israel forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. I'm the only one left. Now, I know that Elijah knows that God's with him. I think that's why he wants to go away. That's why he's under the broom tree. Take me away to be with you. I'm all alone here on earth. All of your people have been killed. It's just me. I don't want to be alone. Take me away. Verse 15, and the Lord said to him, and notice how God speaks back to him and answers him. He doesn't directly answer what he said here. I'm the only one left. I'm the only one left. They seek my life to take it away. God says this in verse 15. Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the prophet of Shaphat, of son of Shaphat, of Abel-Meholah, you shall anoint to be the prophet in your place. It's as though God says to Elijah, alone? Alone? You think you're alone and powerless? You think you're alone and powerless with the presence of God? Let me tell you what you're going to do now, Elijah. You're going to go and anoint two kings. You're going to anoint the king over the up-and-coming regional power. You're going to anoint the new king of Israel who's going to cleanse the land and bring to an end the wicked reign of Ahab and Jezebel. And then you're going to anoint your protege and your successor, alone and powerless. Think about it, Elijah, verse 17. And the one who escapes the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Elijah is not alone. Friends, you're never alone. In fact, you're never alone, even without God in your present state. And what do I mean by that? We always think we're alone. We think it's just God and us. It makes us depressed. Nobody believes anymore. But you got to have faith in this. If you look at the Bible and the history of the church, God always has his people. Even in the most dire circumstances, in countries filled with pagans or filled with communists or filled with Nazis that are hunting down Christians, God always has his people. You're never alone. There's 7,000 in Israel that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. Going on to verse 19. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plying with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him, and he was with the 12th. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him, and he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? 
And he returned from following him and took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yoke of the oxen and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. After all this, Elijah's passing along and he sees 12 team of oxen in a field, 12 pairs of oxen plowing up. What might that 12 represent, friends? It's Israel. And with that final team, is a young man named Elisha. Elisha's name means, my God is salvation. Elijah calls him, and Elisha is serious about saying goodbye to his parents. You remember the story? In the Gospels, we had one here in our reading this morning. People of wealth and influence, Jesus says, come and follow me. And they say, well, let me go back and say goodbye to my mom and dad. But Jesus knows what they really mean by that. It means they want to go back and hang around for a while, and pretty soon they'll forget about following Jesus, and they'll never come. But here we've got a man who says, I'm going to say goodbye to mom and dad, and means it. He takes that yoke of oxen. He takes them off of the yoke, which would have been a, a wooden beam or two that went across the middle of them, and other implements of wood that were connected by rope. He took all that. He sacrificed the oxen. He made a fire out of it with that wood. He made a feast for his servants. They had a feast to celebrate that now he's going to go and be with the prophet. Sacrificed oxen, cooked flesh, made a feast. Elisha's old life is completely burned up. His parents were okay with it, it would seem. And Elijah's not alone. In the midst of a civil war, that engulfed much of Japan in 1560, the Imagawa clan marched on Kyoto with 40,000 men. Alone and in their way was the Oda clan with perhaps 2,000 men led by Oda Nobunaga. Standing alone against his frightened leaders and men, many of whom wanted to surrender, Nobunaga said this, do you really want to spend your entire lives praying for longevity? We were born in order to die. Whoever is with me, come to the battlefield tomorrow morning. Whoever is not, just stay wherever you are and watch me triumph. Rather than going into battle alone, Nobunaga's tiny army joined him, snuck in behind the invading force in a fierce thunderstorm, and fell upon the unsuspecting horde, utterly destroying it and its general, gaining glory that echoes through this age. At the end of the day, God reveals to Elijah that he is not going into battle alone. There are 7,000 with him, but more than that, the Lord of hosts is with him, and with that, you're never alone. Can I hear an amen to that? Amen. You look out at our nation, and that which was normal just a few years ago, marriage between one man and one woman, dressing like and using the restroom of your actual sex, practicing your Christian faith openly are now things that are sneered at even attacked by a growing number of our fellow Americans. But what if we got down to a small handful of the faithful? It's not like that hasn't happened before. But you're never alone. God is with you, and Jesus has promised that the gates of hell will not prevail against the body of Christ. And you're never alone. Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, bless us, encourage us, and strengthen us by reminding us that we're never alone. You are with us. Your Spirit is in us and among us. But we do pray that you would build the body of Christ in our land. For we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.